finish it. I'm going home. <laughs> Are we ready back there? Yeah. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Yeah. Good morning. Welcome to the uh, March version of uh, RV 101. This is prepping your RV for your camping. But basically, it's just about asking questions. This is our illustrious leader, Dave Taylor. He's the fixed operations manager, boss guy. I'm the weekend, I don't know what I do guy. And, we don't uh, either. <laughs> between the two of us, we've got about 70 years in the industry. And what we're trying to do is just share what we know. Yes, and he says he's only been in five years, so we're working out. Uh, we're just here to share what we know and what we think, and so ask questions. Uh, this one's kind of a short one, so um, help us out. Just ask anything you want. With that, uh, I want to do a real quick discussion on batteries before you get into battery maintenance. Is that OK? Yeah. Um, anybody here really want, do we need to go over the different types of batteries. Is there interest in that? Why don't you? Okay. So so, we, have, we have some people here that I yeah. forgot already. The, the two in the back over there don't look like they know too much. <laughs> They're kind of looking at the pool, so. uh, Anyway, what we have here is this is your basic flooded cell liquid lead acid battery. This is the basic. So that when you buy your coach, uh, whether it's a towable or a motorized, most likely your first set of batteries is going to be flooded cell. There, this is a group 24 12 volt battery. It's rated at 80 amp hours when it's brand new. Within a year that's down to about 60 amp hours and they're a fairly high maintenance battery. These folks bought two when they got their coach last year and unfortunately one of them has a dead cell already and uh, we're going to have to exchange that out. Uh, it's a good basic battery. Usually they last three to four years, but once in a while we have a little bit of a problem. Interstate is very good about it. If uh, you have a problem, they don't argue with you. They look at the date stamp, boom, you're done, a little bit of pro rate, and you know, they'll exchange your battery. And then as you get into the industry, most people that do inverter or dry camping or have household appliances, uh, they move up to the absorbed glass mat, AGM. AGM is a fiberglass pouch with a lead plate in it that has the uh, electrolyte, it's a resin, and it's impregnated into that pouch. And then they shovel it together and they seal it. So this is a sealed battery. There is no maintenance, just wipe it off once a year, get the dust and everything off of it. And they're a very, uh, very brutal battery. They can handle deep cycling from inverters much better than the flooded cells. They're, they, they're a much longer life battery. We look at battery performance in potential and in duty cycles. So this one will have maybe 150, 180 duty cycles, which means it'll discharge from a full battery down to a low battery and then back up again. What, what is the potential for a full battery? 12.6. What's the potential charged. for a dead battery? What, when, when it's lost its power, what's the, what's the voltage at? 11.8 11.6. So a half-used battery is 12 volts. 12 volts, that battery, your battery amp hours are half on. So at 11.8 to 11.6 is when your lights start to get dim, your furnace quits running. The heart of your RV is basically dead at that point. So when guys call me and they say, well, my battery still has 10 volts, they're <laughs> nothing left. Uh -huh. They're dead. Yeah. So anyway, the duty cycle of an AGM is about three times as much as the duty cycle. Uh, this is a six volt and Interstate makes a six volt too. 
those have a duty cycle of about 180 to 220 cycles. And these are around 600. So they will last quite a bit longer. They, they will cycle back and forth. And the, the, the good part about that is when you hook it up with solar and a big inverter, they're a lot tougher. They can handle those long dry camps and they can handle times of, of no use and just sitting dormant much better than these. They're a little over twice as much, almost two and a half times as much more money, but you get much longer life and no maintenance and they're, and they're a better, much better guy. If, if you have a smaller coach and you really don't dry cap much, you don't really need much in the way of batteries. The, in, the converter in your coach likes to have at least one battery, and it, it uses the battery as a capacitor filter so that the output of the converter is, is much cleaner and it's more stable. It isn't all over the place. The voltage is much more stable. So if, you do, if you're just a tent trailer or a small trailer, you don't need to dry camp. One battery, one of these is, is more than enough. Just make sure you keep the top clean and keep it full of water. The third battery we have is something that's kind of new on the market, and we were just talking about one of the brands. Uh, this is a lithium ion. Now there's there's several different types. Uh, there's lithium ferrous phosphate. L-I-F-E-P-O-4, and, and that's a very good kind of battery to have, but if you get in a fire with it, just go get your hot dogs and, and let it rip, because the phosphate, you can't put it out with normal fire extinguishers. Having said that, I've never heard of one. Well, I have. It was in an ambulance, but, uh, you know, they're... they're we just, I don't think we're going to have a problem. What, these are mostly capacitors <coughs> and printed circuit boards. And um, not this one, but Battleborn and the other brand that we we're talking about. They have a, a control module that controls all of the little printed circuit board uh, capacitors. and where this battery is going to start out at 12 and a half volts, it's going to go down to 11 and 6, and it'll go down to 8, 4, it'll keep rolling off. These batteries, these again 12 volt, they'll stay 11, 4, 11, 4, 11, 4, 11, 4, 11, 4, 11, 4, 0. They just boom, they shut down. But then they can be recharged in a couple hours. They, they can be high, high frequency recharged and they recharge very rapidly. The downside, these only weigh about 30 pounds, this weighs about 80. The downside is we're still buying these batteries for around 1500 bucks. So we're, we get some that are a little cheaper, but you get what you pay for. The good ones have little stainless steel frames that hold all the little printed circuit boards with the capacitors and they're in little packets. And the cheaper ones, they use plastic and that, and they, they vibrate and they fail faster. So the quality is what you pay for when you buy a lithium ion. So still a little bit of money. Uh, some of the brands are coming out with uh, Battleborn, I believe, now has a 10 year and, and uh, the other brand we were just talking about, I think they're a six year now, six year. Yeah. So that they're extending their warranties a little bit. But uh, another good thing with the lithium ion is if something happens with it, usually what they'll do, they don't have to give you a new battery, they can. Usually they just take the top off and replace the one back cassette. I call it the set, the one back relay set. And then boom, you're all brand new again. With a lead acid or AGM, if you have an issue with a cell, it's it's done. It's done. No, no saving. 
anyway, I'm, I'm pretty much done there unless there's questions on these. And, you know, okay. Turn it over I'll to go you. over to maintenance. We usually ask at the beginning, does everyone here currently have a motorhome or a trailer? I know I said. Okay. So, um, the, the only maintenance really on a battery is to keep the terminals clean. This is one big part. AGM and lithium, all you have to do is keep the top dusted off, keep it pretty. The lead has it. has a liquid in it, and it will evaporate. Depending on how much you're plugged in, the charging battery is warm, and it will evaporate off. So, a lot more maintenance on a lead acid battery. You have to take the top off. Depending on how much, you'll kind of learn here, you'll, you'll kind of learn when to check it. If you're checking it every 60 days and you don't notice anything, you start checking it every 90 days. If you plug in a lot, it's going to evaporate. The more you charge it, the more it evaporates. A lot of people camp and then bring them home, they don't plug them in, so they don't evaporate. Them. So, you, you might find that your normal year of camping requires you to check it only twice a year, or maybe even once a year. Everybody's a little different on their usage. That's with RVs. That's a lot of stuff. People come in. I need solar panels. I want an inverter. What do I need? It's all individual. What you use. What what works best for you. Uh, a lot of dealers <coughs> go in and want solar panels. They'll try to sell you as many. Of course, you'll let them sell you. Uh, if you just want a little solar panel on it to store it next to your house, so when you go camping, you're ready. We'll just tell you what you need. We, of course, we would love for you to say you want 15 panels and an inverter and 12 batteries. And, and Dan's the guy for that. But realistically, most people can get away with less than what they actually think. So if you ever decide you want anything like that, give it Dan. He's here uh, Monday through, or excuse me, Friday through Monday, most of the time. He took some vacation here recently, so I. I had to do this by myself last time, and I really missed it. I had nobody to make fun of. <laughs> Great. So, on a lead acid, you're going to have two caps on top. You have six cells, 2.1 volts per cell. So, you take a screwdriver, you pull them off, and you will look down inside, and you will see that each cell has a plastic cap with things down. You'll be able to see the aluminum plates coming up. You want to make sure that that liquid level is flush with the bottom of those necks. So that will give it room to gas and it will be above the plate. If you ever look in there, you can see the tops of these plates and they're dry. You know, growing up, my grandpa, he had two battery chargers and six batteries going and he was always charging something. I, I realized later he was, it was a futile attempt to keep a bunch of batteries. Once they get dry like that, I, I have not seen one come back yet to 100%. Half, half to two thirds of the life is instantly gone. The so, battery, when it hits air, it, it, the lead goes to lead, it oxidizes. Yeah, so we have lead oxide, and that's a strong bond. The charge can't break it, so you'd have to scrape the outer layer off underwater, scoop the gear on to get it to come back. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, and apparently you had a battery go better. They replaced it the one or the two? No, or? It's, it has yet to be replaced. I mean, I was going once a month to check it during the winter months. It's plugged in. I go out there and it's bone dry on one side. He's got one cell right here. Bone dry. So I fill it distilled water every month and it's still stuck in it. Yeah. Yeah. it. That's because that cell's getting warm, yeah. warmer. So what I happens mean, is when you get a warm, when you get a dry cell, your converter notices, your converter actually thinks you have bad batteries, which you do, but it thinks it's worse than it is. So it's, just, it's sending all of its charge to these, this one cell that's really bad. So this battery will actually start to get warmer and evaporate even faster. So unfortunately, there, there are other dealers also that will say, if you have two batteries, just replace that battery. Truthfully, you need to replace both. Just like taking a, 
the old diesel mag lights and having forced batteries in there and having it start to go dim and only taking two batteries out and putting two fresh ones in. Yeah, it'll be a little brighter. It's going to kill the new batteries a lot faster. Okay. So we always tell people, we, we hate to spend your money, but if you put a new battery on, even though your other battery is only theoretically a year old, that battery has, has lost life to it. And when you plug that new battery in and the old battery together, and hook up that converter, that converter is automatically going to read the older of the two batteries and start throwing a heavier charge into it. We wire them so they charge together, but it will. So what will happen is that that battery you didn't replace will go back really fast. And then you brought down your new battery. So you start playing this cycle. Sure. So the best thing to do is always go new and just maintenance, maintenance. I was kidding with the technician when I went to go get that cream and sugar. We have one in there today. And I said, get ready, Ted. When we're talking about motorhomes, I'll have you come out and explain how it all works in five minutes. Yeah. And he looked at me and said, well, I can do that quicker. Batteries. And I thought, he's right. If you have batteries, you have nothing. If you don't have batteries, you have nothing. So that is your main thing. Everything's driven by batteries. Any more questions about batteries? I had a question. Dan, you didn't say how much the uh, ATM was. What, how much the ATM cost? 475 installed for the six volt. Nine months since we did this. So, so um, and the warranty on the AGMs? I'm sorry? Warranty on the AGMs? He already went over that, but since you were late, we'll let you know. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a complicated thing. Hold up his fingers. Okay? The, uh, the AGM, usually from Interstate's one year. If you bring it in to us and you're having issues with it one year, usually they will swap it out. That is through us. If it's over a year, there's really not... They, you, especially if it's an RV battery and they know it's had a pretty rough life, they usually don't do any swapping for you know 50% off or anything. So your first year, if you're having an issue, I don't know if you know this, but we buy a bunch of batteries. <laughs> a bunch. Like there's pallets that show up every week. So due to that, Interstate treats us really well. So they don't even question we say we have a customer with a bad battery, they just swap it out and warranty with us. Great company. Do we throw in our 2017? No. Well, that, that's up to those guys. I, I, we don't do that. They're not going to throw it. No, they usually, with RV battery, they're, if, if it's within 12 months, yeah, after that, they usually know that they're. Okay. I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to tell you they will. Cause oh, I don't mind. I just did not <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, for, this is Dan's last seminar. So, <laughs> so uh, we're going to move on into your exterior. And oh, I forgot something. Oh, sorry. It's all right. I was just saying, we haven't done this one for what? A year. A year. Yeah. So, I had to look down and see what... Best thing you can buy for checking your lead acid batteries. Looks like, make sure when you go in, it's for acid, not antifreeze, because they look turkey. about the same. Huh? Or, or a turkey baster. Yeah. It's not. Don't get it confused. On a lead acid battery, battery, you want to keep the cells all the same charge. That's how you can tell if you start having a bad cell. When you're taking the top off to fill it, with it fully charged, just go like you're going to put gravy on the turkey, get your water, get your battery float up in here, and you want to be up in the green. And you want them all to be relatively close on the gauge here. If you have all of them that are in the green and one's in the blue, that cell's on its way out. If they're all in the green and one's in the red, the battery's done. So you, you can smudge it a little if you got one hanging down here in the blue. Use it up. Use the battery up. If you're planning on heading out on a four-month trip or something, I would just do it then. Much, yeah. Hydrometer. How much do you put in that to do proper tests? 
fill it up all the way. That's why it has this little bowl. It's like doing a turkey. You never did get the base for half full. You always go clear full. <laughs> Some of these questions. I <laughs> we do actually like this guy. He just unfortunately sat down so we get to pick on him today. If that little floaty deal in there is not fully submerged, then you're not going to get an accurate reading. So fill it up. Okay. Good question. Are we ready? Yeah. We're ready. So I want to talk about um, the next thing is the exterior. And Dave was having a conversation with one of the guys uh, when he talks about what we, what we use for wax. And uh, we're both old school. And I was thinking we probably should get the body shop manager down here one of these uh, Saturdays and have him talk about it. The whole theory of waxing a trailer is if you look at fiberglass, it has little pores in it. And what you want to do is keep the pores full of, and we use the, the good old Carnuba car wax, just Carnuba paraffin wax. We, we just put regular Carnuba wax on there fill the pores of the fiberglass or the paint. They have micropores, and these micropores fill up with bacteria, dust, things like that. That's why a coach looks really dingy after a few years. So you have to take a buffer and buffing compound and your grandkids and wear them out, buff them without coach out. What, it, what you're doing is actually grinding all of that stuff out of the pores of the fiberglass. On some of the older trailers, I don't think we use it so much anymore, but we used to have a vinyl covered aluminum uh, sheet metal, and you didn't wax it or anything, it just, that's what it was, and it, it, it lasted pretty good. But the new stuff all has, you know, body paint and, and things like that, so they all have the fiberglass with the pores in it. It's very important. Uh, I'll tell you how long I've been in this. Back in the late 70s. Holy smokes. Yes. <laughs> people used to say, oh, just when you're down in Mexico, have them do it. They'll do it for 50 bucks. Can you imagine two or three or four Hispanics hitting your 40-foot motorhome, hand washing it, hand waxing it. And they, did, they used to do it for like 50 bucks. And they did a really good job. People used to drive down to Mexico just pretty much to have that done and get out of the rain a little bit, but uh, that's still the best way to handle it. It's to, whether you take it somewhere or have uh, your grandkids do it or not, but washing and then waxing the coach once a year, fill those pores up so there's nowhere for the dust and the pollution and that to settle. That's what keeps the coaches looking good. And it, it keeps the uh, ozone out, keeps them from fading so much. They do a good job. Um, I'm going to go get a, a product. If, can you talk to them a little bit about how you clean the outside? Uh, sure, I was going to go into seals. There you go. Well, the seals, I've got, uh, I got some really beautiful stuff in there. Well, seal it. I'm going to go in the seal and say, uh, you do your slide seals. Okay. <laughs> See, he's, he's a slide out guy. I'm a roof seal guy. And we do a ton of repairs on, on roofs and floors and walls and couches and cabinets because there's water intrusion. That can happen 90 days after purchase. Most manufacturers and small print say all seals are only warrantable for 90 days. That's why we offer a free roof inspection starting as soon as you purchase the unit. Even if you didn't purchase it with us, we'll look at your roof seals and side seals. Now, they will last longer than that, but their idea is to get you prepared to maintain your rig. And with doing that, you accept ownership of it. You accept that this thing can't be 100% all the time unless you Join in, make sure it stays that way. So, on most of these roofs, they use a self leveling sealant. Uh, it's real sticky when it comes out brand new, and it'll stay sticky for a long time. 
it'll actually stay pliable for 20 years. What's M1? Is that new? This is, a, I tried this, yeah it is. I tried this because the guys like it, and when I put the, the, uh, Sorry, I'm wearing something now. When I put the uh, roof on my carport, I sealed the uh, ground, and that's really a really good stuff. Okay. I was impressed with it. Excellent. Yeah. I'm used to uh, some other stuff we have here. Apparently we're not using that on the street. I have to give us some of that and try it. Anyways, it's a self-leveling seal, meaning that when you squeeze it out, it's that wide, and when it relaxes, it's that wide. So it just kind of pulls out. We give it a day or so to kind of get the skin over the top, and then it's ready to go. What happens is, after nine months to a year and a half to two years, depending on where you live, this roof vent right here, it's in your roof, I just use it because everybody can usually, if you get up there and look straight down, that's what it looks like. You have a screw hole all the way around that, but it was four inches, four to six inches. They stick that for a big hole in the ceiling and then they, manufacturers, they don't have to use tubes like us. They have these big 55 gallon runs out of the machine where they just never run out. They squirt it all along this edge and around these. Usually what they'll do is squirt it around the edge and then kind of around these screw holes like that. And then it warps out over here. It's all sealed. So what happens is with the weather, traction, expansion, it will move back and forth. You're driving it across roller tracks and roofs move and everything moves in an RV. What happens is you'll start getting a crack in the ceiling. It's real faint. And as he said, pollution and dust. The real faint stuff in the air, the pine needles, the squirrel doo-doo, whatever you got landing on the roof is going to start heating into where this is expanding and contracting. So it'll look like you have this little crack in it. For the first several years, that crack is usually just a visible crack. It's not very deep. So usually after a couple years, two to three years, depending on if you keep it in a shop or not, where you go, do you go down to the sun, do you stay up here? We'll have you come in and we'll take pictures. And we'll say, you know, you got some little cracking. We should probably do some overlay. Take an overlay, which is basically the same thing they put on the roof. We go up there, we take cleaners, we clean this crack out, all the cracks all over the roof, and then we squirt another big old blob of that down this crack and it rolls over the crack. And that's okay for four or five, six years, depending. And there's going to be a day we're going to get up there and we're going to blow your mind. Because we're going to come off the roof and say, okay, it's time for a whole new peel and seal. And you're going to say, well, that can't be much. So we explain to you, we have to peel, we have to take a hot knife, take putty knives, and map gas. We get them hot, and we have guys that can do this without hurting anything. And we peel off about 95% of all that ceiling. Then he's got to go around and reseal all of that. So, 35 foot fifth wheel, depending on what's on the roof, can easily be. 12 to 14 hours, so it can get a little expensive. However, that's part of owning an RV, that's part of ownership. It's, it's like pulling the weeds out of the front yard. Some people are really good at it. You know, as you drive down the street, you can find people that really aren't. Okay. Um, so maintenance, maintenance on roof seals, side seals. You want to go over that? I'm the, I have somebody yeah. here i got to talk to for a couple yeah. minutes. Yeah. I'll be right back. So, uh, to finish off with the outside of your coach, um, when this stuff first came out, I just thought it was a gimmick. But then, when push comes to fudge and shove, I started playing with it. On your roof, you have a, what you call an ethylene polydimorphic rubber, EPM rubber roof. And that rubber has a pigment on it because rubber is black and that just absorbs too much heat. So 
what we what they do is they put a, a, a white beige tan uh, pigment on the rubber. The pigment sheds off and you see it coming down the sides of your coach. So the cure to that is what we do. Before we do this peel and seal, we get up there with a pressure washer and we keep the tip about nine inches away from the deck. We don't try and drill holes with it. But we pressure wash that whole coach. And then we scrape all of this seal it off and put new seal it on. Well, when you're done with that, we can do this, or if you don't mind getting up on the roof and uh, doing it yourself, you apply this rubber roof seal. And what this does is like shellac. And once you do it, you don't ever get up on your roof when it's wet out because this stuff is slick when it's wet, but it's like shellac. It's a seal for the ethylene polydimorphic rubber, and it, it seals the pigment so it doesn't shed the pigment, and it, it, it really preserves the sealing rubber. Uh, it, it just really gives it longevity, and the stuff really works. I've been using it for years, and I've been pressing it. Uh, it's, they've been out for about 10 years, and um, I'm 100% ready. All you do is pour it out and mop it on, and however you want to do it. And just brush it on, roll it on, and just, you're just slopping it on. And this don't let like too much get over the side, but uh, this stuff really works when it's dry. Uh, you can walk on it as long as it's dry, but boy, it's stuff gets slick when it's wet. But it's okay, really good stuff. Um, I don't have any other comments other than that. It really just, a lot of people can do it themselves, and we do sell a lot of it. And we, we, we don't have the complaints. What do you do to for a 35 foot pit with a 40 foot coach? How many of those gallons do you need? Um, just one and a half. Yeah, yeah this will do 25 foot roof or something. They're not designed for People have been asking me for yeah. years, how do I, what do I use to loop my slide out mechanism? And my answer is nothing. Uh, the manufacturers don't tell you to loop it, but some guys just really feel like they need to loop it. The problem is, is they get down there with lithium grease or something, and lithium grease is about the stickiest thing in the world. So you run your rooms in, you drive down the highway and all that road dirt splashes up on this lube and it gums up your mechanism. The, the lithium attracts the gravel, the, the, the dirt, the mud. The next thing you know, it's mixed up and shoved into your gears. Not a good thing. Those rooms are dry from the factory for a reason. Uh, they, they're not points of wear specifically. And Without lubing them, they'll still last 20 years if you know you don't wreck them into a tree or something. If a guy is absolutely anal and he has to lube his rooms, uh, this is a dry silicone lube. It isn't sticky. When it dries, you can't feel it's there except for a slick. It's silicone lubricant. And if that's what you got to do and God intended you to do it, buy some of this. It works very well. It won't ruin your slide. My wife of about 40 years is a grease queen and I'm sure a lot of women know exactly what that means. A lot of hand lotion and all of that. And you do it for a reason. Um, that's what this stuff is for. Your wipe seals and your coach, uh, they age they, uh, they dry out, and they're there to wipe the moisture off the room so that, you know, when it comes in, it isn't in a puddle on the floor. Well, this is like hand lotion. This is really good for your rubber wipe seals and your bulb seals on your slide rooms. You run your slide room about halfway out, and you all around the outside, all around the inside, and it dries on and it's absorbed into the rubber. Uh, the pores in the rubber absorb it. it. It's smoother against the wall of the room 
and it really is good for the longevity of the rubber. When we do a slide room, let's say a guy's neglected it, it's about 12 years old, and his, his wipe seal is starting to rip. A lot of the extended service contracts will cover gaskets and seals, and they'll cover them. And the typical price for one slide room is around $1,200 because there's eight, ten hours labor and wipe seal is up to 50 or so a foot. Do the math. You've got both sides, the top, and then you have some kind of uh, seal underneath. And that's only the wipe seal, and that doesn't include the bulb seal. And it, it can get very expensive. So this is, anybody that has a, a coach with a slide out, this is really good stuff. This is, this, you, you need to do this to keep your, your seals moist and, and, and in good shape. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's an old timer. Because I'm new at this. But he says he uses the Portland Um, You know, you should come back for the winterize because people tell us, well, we put ice in our holding tank to clean it out, and the people sit around the fire, and they come up with the most god-awful thing. <laughs> now, petroleum jelly is about the stickiest snot you can buy. So, yeah, let's put that greasy crap on the side of our beautiful coach so that it collects all the dirt. Am I done? No, I still live that. So, hey, yeah. you're a tough yeah. Irishman. You can handle it. <laughs> I'm no, just curious. Yeah, there's better products. Yeah. When you're new, you're susceptible, you know. Yeah. Well, that's that's why I'm on standing here holding this in front of you, shaking it. Yeah. Plus, uh, depending on the year of the unit, they're better now with the rubber on the seals. But years ago, people used to come in and they'd say, "What happened to my seals? You put petroleum jelly on it, they will swell up." Uh -huh. We used to get people did do that in their toilets. Petroleum jelly just sucks right into it and your toilet seal's gone. Uh, yeah, newer seals are better, but this is nice and clean, doesn't bring anything in. So and that's for like yearly? Once a year, please. On that roof treatment too, once a year. Young lady, yes, how can we help you? That's what I wonder, how often you should. Yeah, yeah. once a year. Once a year. Okay. You want to talk about, about the exterior? No, I kind of went over my big thing, which is seals. And you went over slide seals. One last thing. This stuff's been around forever. It's not toothpaste. But he goes out camping. 20 minutes after he's all done, he's got this out of his toolbox. And he's going around his windows and his tail lights and, and his compartment doors. And it just. It's like toothpaste, but it's clear. And there's a seal around it. Just go around and touch it up. If you see any cracks, it's a good thing to cover your little side cracks. You can do it yourself. The, the, the around the windows? Yeah, if, you, if you're if you noticing around your bay doors or windows or plug-in receptacle or anything you have coming out the side that starts to get a little dirty crack around it, Clean it off with a toothbrush and a little cleaner, and just apply a little more. That will definitely lengthen the life of your seals until you get to a point where you come in and we blow your mind and say, it's going to be 20 hours to seal all the sides. Do you use a discount if you use it at Easter? What's that? If you use it at Easter, you get a discount. Why is that? It's an Easter seal. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. I'm going to use that. <laughs> I don't know. So, he used to have one of those walking sticks, and I broke it over a guy's head because the guy was using silicone, like you do around your tub or something, on the side of his coach. And we, did, we don't use silicone in this industry, except for maybe to seal around the shower. I think. That's the only time we use it. And the reason is twofold. Number one, Silicone is polar. So if you have two pieces of metal, 
let's say you have an aluminum frame and your window frame is aluminum, or the, the light basal is aluminum, aluminum will molecularly bond to the one surface and repel itself from the other surface. And it may, be, it may look just beautiful, but on the one side, it is absolutely offended and it will not contact that, and the water just whipped in underneath. And then you have hell to play uh, just to peel all of that off. So um, that's what this is for. It's a good solvent. It won't react with any of the materials, and it'll actually break that down and remove it. What we use are specific chemicals that are designed for our industry. And the reason that that's so important, the manufacturer of the rubber roofs, the ethylene polydimorphic rubber, the EPDM rubber that's on your roof, and it may be one of the newer versions, there is a chemical in here, it's called a carrier solvent, and this carrier solvent keeps this stuff liquid. Once you caulk it out, then the carrier solvent is used to etch it to the material in your ceiling, and then it evaporates. And if you go down to Jerry's and you buy some good damp sealer that's on sale for $2.97 instead of $12, you pulp that out on your roof, your rubber is going to turn to cottage cheese because the carrier solvent in that damp sealer that's intended for wood and masonry is going to eat that rubber. So as much as we love Jerry's and we spend a lot of money there, um, that's not the place to get stuff for your RV. All of these RV chemicals that we have are specifically designed for the kind of materials that we use on the RVs. So these do not react with the, the, the wall, the roofing, any of the materials. We've had coaches, and, and to replace a rubber roof that somebody's trying to fix it, he goes and buys some snow seal at Jerry's or Home Depot or something. A roof can cost anywhere from six to twelve thousand dollars to take it apart, put a new rubber membrane on. There are a lot of money. So spending twelve bucks a tube on this isn't so bad anymore. That's why we use it. Anything else on that? You have not lost it, I'll tell you what. You're still there. Yeah, maybe here. I've I got three you cracked your... ribs, so I'm not moving too fast. I was going to have you do your own chassis dance. No. And then I get to go into uh, water systems, because that's my favorite. Okay. You want to go over chassis at all? Your tires? Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. So, water systems. Maintaining them, getting them ready. The most important thing you can do is clean your water system. It's a sealed system, so it gets, believe it or not, it's humid inside of a water tank, even if there's no water in it. You think there's no water in it. When they build a tank, they have high-speed spin fittings, they call them. They spin up into these poly tanks. So even if you drain all the water out of your fresh tank, there's a lip in there from that high-speed fitting. It's about a quarter of an inch high. There's water sitting in there. You always want to put your cap back on done draining it. But if that sits there four or five months in the winter, it's humid in there. The stuff can start growing. So the best thing you can do at the beginning of the year is to seal your system up to get it ready to go. Put in about a half cup to a cup of bleach in your water system. And then fill it up with fresh water. Turn your water pump on and let it pump through everything. My water heater, the shower, the toilet, through air-free hose pipe in there. That's going to kill off anything you have going. We have seen <coughs> tanks come out of Florida and Texas, come up here, and people say, I got this green slime running out my faucet. And the tank is so bad, we just basically replace the tank. Because they've, they've been at a park for six months down in Florida, plugged into water, they didn't need to use their fresh water tank, had a little water in it, and 
I've heard stories where they've left the tank drains off and they're, they've actually found the little guppy, you know, frogs, what we used to call them as a kid, you know, yeah, yeah in tanks. So you want to get that bleach in there to kill everything off. Then when you're done with that, you're going to dump it all out. You're going to do just like you're going to do a winterize. Open your low points, your tank drain, open everything up top, let it drain out. Then you're going to take a little, how much vinegar? He likes vinegar, I like baking soda. How much vinegar do you put in? The same amount as I use. Okay, half a cup to a cup of, of vinegar. And fill your tank back up and run that vinegar through. Some people don't do that. I do baking soda. It does not cut the smell of the chlorine. The vinegar cuts the smell of the chlorine, but then when you're taking a shower, you start dreaming of pickles. So that's our only battle on. They both work. It just depends on. So take, keep your tanks clean. When you're doing that, your water heater. Half a box. It's cheap. You, it, you can't really have too much. So half a box, and then throw the rest in the freezer. The water what here. Are, what are you talking about in the freezer? You get it all soft, perfectly when it's clean, and no holes in it. And then either put coffee or baking soda in, and tie a knot, throw it in the freezer, and it'll absorb all the oil. That's what he's talking. Okay. So your water heater round. This is looking at the outside of your water heater. You're gonna, it's going to have a square door. You're going to open it up and it's going to look square. Behind there is a cylinder. From 6 gallons to 12 gallons. Out here there's going to be a slug bad looking plug. There's going to be a plug. Believe it or not, all the water that goes into the top side of this water heater Cold in and hot out. All the water that goes in that has any impurities, hard water, calcium, iron, whatever, whatever, yeah. The further you go south, the worse it gets. It starts to accumulate in the bottom of this. And it will, in time, fill this up. We've actually, so you're going to want to pull this plug. Well, you're doing that once a year. Get your tank saver. Hooks to your garden hose. Has a little on and off on it. Or you can, if you're industrious. Mine is, I was a technician for years, so mine's all fancy stainless hose. And, you know, it's cool. I had to have the coolest one in the shop. Until somebody built one cooler. So you're going to take this, take it where you took that plug out, you're going to run it in there and turn it on and start washing your tank out. What you'll notice is tons of white congealed goo and gook come out of your hot water heater. Believe it or not, it happens in houses too. That's why most houses have a drain on the bottom. It's not just for when it goes bad and you want to replace it. As soon as I got in this industry every year, I hook a garden hose to my water heater and give it drain out about 10 or 15 gallons. So we've had these fill up so bad that when we pulled the plug out, no water came out. And we've had to take a screwdriver and a hammer and bust through this. Usually we'll try to talk a person into buying a new one because at that point, all this down in here, I don't know if any of you had a grandmother, you went to her house when you was a kid and took a shower and they were on a well and it smelled a little sulfury. And you start getting that on your hot water side, it's because this thing is contaminated. It's not so much contaminated because you killed it with bleach, but it is just a stinky. It's, it's not good. The best way to fight that is just start right from the beginning. Get in there and get it washed out. Another thing is anode rods. Some have anode rods, some don't. Most of them, most of them you can put an anode rod in now. Some don't require them because they're not an aluminum tank. Some are actually filled with uh, 
What's the toilet made out of? Well, the suburbans are steel with a coarse glass. Yes. Most of them have a glass line that's like a porcelain line. And they don't wear out as much. They still collect contaminants, but they don't, nothing will eat into them. This is just like on a boat or a ship. Anything you don't want water to eat into, an etch, you put this in your water heater. It eats this away instead of the water heater. Well, when it eats this away, it drops into the bottom of the water heater. So it's not bad for you to drink or cook with or take a shower with. It just adds more contaminants, however it saves the tank. Does that make sense? You got this, Ashley? Okay. Um, any questions on tanks, black tanks, fresh tanks, great tanks? Yeah, water tank. Well, they take that cylinder, they drill a hole in it, and put an aluminum tube through it, and then they weld that in. And it's right back over here. And then you're, what he asked was, how do they, how does it heat, basically, with gas? You're going to have a gas valve over here if you open it up. You'll see a gas valve, and you'll see this little vent looks like a candy cane. What it does is, that big cylinder of the tube that goes through this tube, touching the water, and when you fire it, the gas valve opens, the igniter ignites it, the thermostat tells it it can, and then it shoots this big, nice pretty blue flame right in through that cylinder, and it heats very fast. That's a trick. If you're camping, if, if you're camping and you both have to get ready to go somewhere, and you have to take your showers relatively close together, even if you're plugged in and you have your water heater on 110, when you jump in to take your shower, kick the gas on it also. It will work with both, and the gas recovers faster than an element. So usually one person takes a shower, then about 10 minutes, the next person can get in there. I always suggest letting your wife take the first one just in case it's not warm enough, you don't hear about it. So that's in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For some reason, she has a whole lot more hair products in the shower than me, and she takes longer to do it. The electric element's in the bottom? The electric element is, yes, usually on the inside. On the inside. On Atwood. Suburban is on the outside. Am I right? I got this. Yeah. Yeah. One, one, you can, one you can actually get from the outside, one is on the inside. And you're going to replace it without emptying it. No. no. The element goes right up into the water. So, uh, however, they both empty out the outside. Yeah. I mean, that's important to get that scum out of there. Uh, it's on the element. Yep. It does eat it up. The efficiency of the heat. Yep. I replaced my hot water tank elements in my hot water about every two years at home. I live on a well and it's good water. It just has a lot of calcium and stuff in it. And when I take those out, you can really see. Any more questions about black tanks, great tanks, fresh water, how a pump works? I love talking about poop, if anybody likes to get into black tanks. Okay, we're going to talk black tanks. I'm glad you asked to talk about black, black tanks. you got to keep it clean. Happy camper. You can sit around the campfire with all your buddies, and they'll tell you, Oh, we use dishwashing liquid, or we use uh, the packets from the dishwasher. Don't let anybody talk you into putting gravel in there. We've seen it. Yeah, gravel. Yeah, we've had people tell us gravel. And, you know, I've heard the old thing, oh, I just put ice in my tank, and, or, you know. I've tried that. You have a black tank that's 50 gallons. You put 30 gallons of water in it, out of your well, or the, however cold you can get it, in there. you run in there and throw four bags of ice in it. And before you're 30 feet down the road, it's already melted. I mean, it's, it, those chunks of ice just aren't going to stay in there and bang around for very long. They're, they're done. So, 
use a chemical, an American-made chemical, not a Chinese chemical that may not be as good for the environment. This is made, this was actually made, the story is, and if they're watching, I always, as much as we, right there, as much as I push this stuff, I always say I'm pretty, I don't know why they haven't seen it and why they haven't sent us donuts. Because they're made in Medford, and they started doing septic tank cleaners. And they realized it works so well in eliminating odors and cleaning. It's an active enzyme. So when you put it in there, it starts to eat stuff. It starts eating it up, making it soft. And that's what you want. When you dump your tank, you don't want big hard things rolling out. You want you want milkshake, not brownies. So, sorry. <laughs> You're done with your coffee, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Coffee just doesn't taste as good after my speech on this stuff. Um, it's great stuff. You go out in the shop, there's five or six brands, and we'll say whatever brand you want. A lot of people, I don't care how much you tell them about this, they'll be like, you know what, I've used the other stuff for 50 years, and that's what I'm using. I'm happy for you, use it. If it works for you, if you go out in that shop right now, we got 40 bays, and I bet you in every bay, there's one or two of these sitting on a guy's toolbox. Because if we have to work on it and pull the toilet off, we're going to put some of this down in there first. So, happy camping. It's good stuff. Waiting for my donuts. <laughs> so also, what it's going to do is help you... I'm going to burn up another paper. I got a whole box of You have a black tank, you have the sink sitting on top, you have your dump down here, the little T handle comes out. While you're using this, or you're camping with the black tank, if you go for two days, you've only put this much waste in it. The last thing you want to do is go home or go to a dump and pull that handle because you have no volume here. So what happens is, about this much of it rolls out and this just kind of stays up here. Your liquid rolls out and most of your salt stays inside. So take that morning before you go, stand there at the toilet, look down the hole, put your foot on the feed, fill it, tell it it's up in here. I fill mine until I can hear it. I can hear mine start to down here that. What that does is that gives you plenty of volume, a lot of clean water. So then, I went camping with my friend Steve. We started camping for Steve Oberlin four or five years ago. And he's been in the industry forever, but he was in production. So he knew how to install them, never how to maintain them. Well, he pulled out behind us. I have a fifth wheel. He has a fifth wheel. Big, I have a big fill of wool. Because my wife has a lot of hair products. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're going to the, yeah, when you're going to the dump station, there's a reason they make that road 15 feet wide in the campground. That's so you can get a little swing going in your coach or your trailer. You want this water to start doing that oscillating dishwasher action in there. Slosh. Slosh, you want some slosh. Anything that's sitting down here, you want to start getting it up in the air. So when you get down to the dump, you can hook it up and pull the handle. 99% of it comes out. If you can do it at home, if you have a clean out or a spot built for your RV, at least once or twice a year, I will add half the camper, fill it up, let it sit three or four days, and I will do this twice in a row. And you'll be surprised after you do it once and you'll think, ooh, that was a good flush. Dude, we actually sell see-through sewer, sewer pieces for the addition that goes on here. It's not to gross everybody out, it's to actually so you can see that you're getting clean. And I have a six inch one I use. And you'll be surprised, you can do it four or five times if you've never done it before. You do it four or five times and you're still like, holy, where's this coming from? There's a lot in there. What happens is if you guys can realize that he's really into this. <laughs> yeah, we, we spend a lot of customers' money on this. And I hate to say that. 
I would rather not. I would. I would rather take. I would. I would rather you pay us for something broken, not something I think man they they could have they could have done this if they'd have known. Uh, they wouldn't be here paying hundreds of dollars. Pros. Getting more and more digital now. A lot of digital probes on the sides of the tanks. Even with them, if you get a build up inside, they work off resistance. They shoot this imaginary laser beam through that tank, and when they see see something there, it turns a light on inside. So you start dumping your tanks, and you dump it, and you go inside and it still says half full. Chances are it's not half full. Hopefully, it's just got a little slime. Got a little turd harpooned on it right here. Because that happens. That doodle little pain right there. Where is that? Right there. Oh, okay. Right you usually draw it bigger, so. Uh, uh, yeah. Let's just say it's not pretty in a tank. I, we've had to take them out. Well, the so, must have been under a lot of pressure. Yeah. Like that. Um, so this happy camper also cleans the sides of the tanks out. So you want to use it, you can probes plain. We get people to come in eight months after they buy a unit and it's under warranty. And they come in and they see Dan. They tell Dan what's going on and Dan says, well, I'm going to save you some money. Buy this happy camper. Usually we'll even give it to you first year. Here's a free happy camper. Go home, soak your tanks two or three times, four or five days at a time. Start using this every time. And within the next two or three months, you go camping. You'll be reading it to you again. People can't believe that. They know they bought a unit, still in the warranty, and by golly, Dan better fix it. So then Dan says, okay, well, you sign this piece of paper, it's terms of service. And on that terms of service, it says, if we repair anything that's not deemed warranty from the manufacturer, guess who gets to pay? You do. So then Dan sends it out to the shop, and the first thing the technician does is load that baby full of that. Stands there, fills it up, has the forklift driver come around, grab it, has him rock it back and forth for about three or four minutes, and he dumps it. He still reads half full. So he does that again, then he goes to break, then he comes back and fixes another guy's stuff, then he comes back and he has to look at it, fill it back up, shake it again, and it goes to empty. There's nothing we can tell the warranty company except there was a turn on the probe here. So what happens is if you show up and Dan says, it took us two hours to do all this mankanka and about $260, you want to pay with a check or your credit card. And then all of a sudden, they're not happy with Dan anymore. So you've been there. Oh, really? <laughs> so you have to remember that. Maintenance is not something warranty covers. It's something we go over a lot. We still have people that out of warranty and still think that probes should be warranty. It's not that we're mean, but we can't we can't take care of your menu, you know. Sometimes you have to own it. And very very few times I have not seen that work. So for instance, I bought a used Montana. It's a 2008. Great unit back in 2008. I bought it in 2016. 2016, black tank, red full all the time, all the time. And I started working on it. We lived in it for about a year and a half in between houses. And I got it down to where it was reading a half. And I never could get it to go any longer. So it, however, it worked for me. Because when you're looking at that button, who cares if it's a third full? Who cares if it's a half full? It's that three-quarter and full marks where you want to know where you're at. Truthfully. I always wondered why people, why they put a third in there. Give me the two-thirds or give me the half and three-quarter. Because that's what you need to know. So keep them clean. A lot, a lot of people spend a, a lot of dollars here on maintenance items. And I would really like, like Dan and I, we would rather fix your warranty items or install solar panels or washer dryers or whatever you want for fun, not for, not just to have you pay us. Okay, any more about poop or did I get it through it? Okay. 
you go into some of your appliances? Yeah, I'm going to do chassis. Oh, okay. But before we do, uh, I have these out here to remind everybody, every spring you need to replace your filters. Yes, I forgot and, about filters. Uh, these, are, these are a good filter. You hook it up to the hose bib. These are designed to just get the big chunks out. Um, the five micro pore type charcoal filters, they do a great job, but they fill up really fast. And people always want to know, well, how do I tell when up my filter's full? Well, when you're not getting any water flow, that means it's full. So uh, these are a real good deal. They get the big chunks out. They last a while, three to six months, depending on where you're at. Uh, they're cheap. This is a good deal. Uh, if you have a canister type, we, we have the basic filters uh, all the way up. Uh, stuff actually lives in here. I don't think we have frogs in here, but there's bacteria that lives in these filters. So you just don't want to leave these filters. When you winterize in the fall, you take that thing out and throw it away. And you always make sure you have at least one or two extra filters. That way you don't have to worry about whether you get the right one or not because there's a lot of different ones. So if you have a filter, bring it in, we'll match it up, um, and you can go from there. These are very important, and it's a safety thing because of the things that live in there. If and I guys, oh, go ahead. Uh, if you guys have questions on any of this stuff, uh, I'm here Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Just give me a call, email me, whatever. Stop uh, in. I'm deaf, so email is, is by far the best. So with that, I'd like to talk about chassis. Most of this is stuff that Dave knows. Does anybody, I didn't even ask, does anybody here have a motorhome? Okay, so you're yeah. supporting home too. Okay. Yeah, everybody's got a motorhome. Okay. Yeah. I just didn't want you to go through the whole well, dance thing that, for a bunch of I'm just going to measure this. Okay. Uh, one of my soapboxes is my house. I live out on a farm out here couple of miles out of town, they have natural gas. Uh, they, they put the red or the, the black iron pipe under the house, test it, they're done. Fifty years later, still good. We have black iron manifolds in our RVs, then the feet, the feeder lines are all copper. The problem with it is RVs move and these things are flexing going down the road. So my house, they tested it when they built it. It's going to be good for a long time. Uh, it's an absolute rarity that you have an LP or natural gas leak in a house, it's just because they don't move. They're very static and very well built. The RVs, they move and they flex. And so we highly recommend uh, that you have your LP system tested once a year. Last year, when you went over those railroad tracks a little bit too fast, you may have tweaked something. You now we've got a small LP leak. Nobody knows about that leak until the house goes boom, or until you have a LP system check. When we do these seminars, we're not here necessarily to sell you anything. We're here to give you our advice and our knowledge. But we do sell, we do offer a spring tune-up. And I'm sure that a lot of dealers do this. We charge 100 bucks, two hours of labor for a technician for 130 an hour. So $260 worth of labor for 100 bucks. And we go through all sorts of, all of the systems. We do an LP system check so that you know what condition your LP system is in. And it's a good peace of mind thing. A lot of dealers do this. You have a test, it's called a drop-down test, to make sure that the system will hold pressure. And then another thing that we do that a lot of people don't do is we have a dynamic flow test. So let's say that you had a great summer, but you didn't really use your RV much, and then you go winter camping, you've got the water heater on, you've got the furnace on, you've got two stoves going, and everything's just not staying lit. That's because of higher flow rates on the propane, sometimes the regulators fail. And so a, a secondary test that will test 
to see whether your regulator could carry a specific load. Uh, usually we will run uh, two burners, a water heater, and a refrigerator in the furnace just to see what a maximum flow rate would be on that regulator. And these are important things to do, especially the safety of the, the, the leak down chest. Uh, we, we do a lot of different things on those uh, spring tune-ups, but a lot of dealers do it, and I highly recommend doing it. Having said that, uh, one of the, our main topic here on chassis is annual service for your, your towed vehicle or your motor. Now, on a, a towed vehicle, you use you know, a uh, bearing pack once a year. Bearing pack once a year. And those are how much? Or every two, every two years, depending on how much you use it. Mm -hmm. the, it's $98 an axle, and usually the price of the seals. So, usually $200. 30 to 240 bucks. So, what we're, and I know nobody here, but there's a lot of people that watch this. What we look for when we do a bearing pack on a towable is this trailer is sitting there and the wind is blowing it back and forth. And it may have sat there for four years and not moved. So, you think, well, everything's fine. But what's happening is those the little rollers and those bearings are rubbing against the races and you get from sitting in the wind and walking around in it, you get grooves in the bearing. Not so much on a motorhome, uh, but definitely a, an issue in a motor. So a bearing pack, just like a propane system check, a bearing pack, one of the things we do is we check the races for grooves and if there's chips and grooves or pitting, out they go, and that way you're not failing on the side of the highway. On a motorized, uh, people say, well, I want my front bearings pack. Well, on a motorhome, they have uh, oil-filled bearings, and they're sealed, and uh, I think Ford said, uh, I think it's 100,000, 96,000 miles when you take it into Ford and have the seals replaced in that. Uh, the, the motorhomes really don't have a lot of normal annual maintenance on the chassis as far as the front end or the rear end. What, one of the things I used to do, a lot of performance type sales, uh, banks, exhaust, exhaust brakes, satellite systems, solar panels, inverters, suspension stuff. And we used to talk to people a lot about people were keeping their, their older coaches and one of the first things that truckers do when they buy a coat, when they buy a motorhome, is they take it into their shop and they drain the differential fluid and they put a synthetic fluid in it with a heat exchanger type differential cover. And when they do this, they get enough. The average is about one more mile per gallon just by getting rid of the heat out of the differential. And we recommend that um, the synthetic differential loop is the way to go, especially if you're going to go around the country and put 10,000 miles on this thing, you'll save, well, if, if you get eight miles per gallon, now you get nine, you know, that's, that's over 10%. That's, that's, that's a crucial uh, So. A synthetic differential loop, and, and then the differential covers that have the, the, the ribs on them for heat exchange, they, you know, that's the only cooling that differential has. And uh, they used to have problems when they get so hot they blow the seals. The differentials do get hot, and that's, that's a good, good thing to do. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about on chassis is another one of the things that David and I if we've seen this so many times. I have a trailer. It, I just replaced the cover that is five years old, and it hasn't moved in six years, maybe seven years. But the tires are up off the ground. But if I ever use it again, when I retire, um, I'm putting tires. On. The manufacturers and the government look at 
entire life, I've heard six, seven, but we've been doing eight to nine years. If you buy a used coach and say it's a 2009, and the salesman's real slick and he says, yeah, look, I've got those tire guards. Those tires are 13 years old. Those are illegal safety hazard tires. Tires only are intended to last eight or nine years. They, they, they follow the semi trucks really close, but semis, they'll go 200, 300,000 miles a year. So they go through a set of tires every three to six months. So they don't care. But in our industry, where coaches sit sometimes, if you sit in one spot, the cord starts to get flat, you take off, you get this thump going down the road for a while until the rubber warms up. That's a flat spot, and eventually you're going to damage the cords in that, and you're going to end up in the ditch. So, not trying to scare anybody, but there are date codes on those tires, and when you buy a new tire, unless it's a discount like I'll pay over on the highway there, Al Qaeda, um, they're going to sell you, you need to buy tires that are within six months of the date of manufacture, not three or four years. Because those people are dumping tires. And they're old, they're already three or four years old. So wherever you go, make sure that they're reputable and they're selling you fresh tires. But also, if the, if the coach is set for two or more years, we, we see this all the time. Well, you know, the guy had it, never used it, it just sat there. But all the way from that guy's house to his house, he had three blowouts. That's because these tires sat and they get flat spots and then they start beating themselves up. And they take out the side of your coach and, and it's just not pretty. So tire age is extremely important. Some guys like to get all fancy and they, well, I want a wider tire, I want a bigger tire. The manufacturer of that chassis designed that coach with a specific weight in mind. And they put that sticker on the sidewall by driver's behind, and it tells you what tire size that coach was designed for and what pressure operated. I don't care what the tire says, I don't care what anybody says, you go by that sticker because the manufacturer of the tire, they say, okay, at 98 pounds, that tire will support 3,300 pounds. At 105 pounds, it will support this. They've done the math, they've done the engineering. The manufacturer, like Newmark, they, they take that and they say, okay, we're going to use this tire because of the stance. We're going to use this pressure because this is our load. And that doesn't change. It doesn't matter what brand of tire you buy, the, spe the, spe the specific specs of that size of tire do not vary appreciably from one brand to another. So if you add good years and, and you decide that you just want to put some Chinese tires on there, which some of them are pretty good, you stay with the same size tire and you say, stay with the same pressure. That's how they were designed and that's how you do it. But don't trust old tires. Uh, they're too nice of people. Uh, the tires are a premium, but they're, they're a very good safety. Line. And that's all I've got. Yeah, I don't so, run my fifth wheel tires more than five years. Five years, I get rid of them. I've seen too many. You've seen a lot. And we're only one. We're, in the scheme of things, we're, we're one little speck in Oregon, but you see a lot of stuff happen, and usually it starts happening about that five-year mark. So, I have a friend of mine that had a blowout. No matter how good your coach or motorhome is, they're not designed to take that type of beating. No. And it tears up the fingers, the cabinets. I mean, it just if you can up. keep it on the road. Yeah. Right. If you ever want to see fun, as long as it doesn't get you to panic. Just go to YouTube and dial in motorhome tire blowout. Watch that for about a half hour. Yeah. You have to be pretty strong to keep that thing on the road. 
The only, uh, the only other thing is appliances, but uh, I was just gonna. Appliances are quick. Okay. Clean, clean, clean. The refrigerator has an outside door. Open it up. Make sure no squirrels have made a home in there. Wipe it out. If you have an air blower, compressor in your shop, blow it out. Your water heater, open the door, blow it out. Wipe it. Just you know, most most appliances, everything that matters is sealed. But you still want to make sure nothing's growing in there. No mouse has made a home in behind your refrigerator. Uh, wasps. You get a lot of wasps built up. So just clean, clean, clean. This the best part of having an RV is the maintenance. Any questions about anything else? We got a little. We're done right on time, so we can talk about anything. Yes. Oh, I thought I saw you raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. Tell me again the, the, uh, the spring uh, check. Spring tune-up. What it includes, and you get, can you get a roof inspection at the same time? That is. That comes at the same time. The it's, the, the spring tune-up is $89. It takes us about two hours to do. And it goes over all your water products, all your gas products, we fire all your appliances, we fill your tanks, we pressurize everything, we check your seal lengths, your roof seal, side seals, we hydrometer test your batteries. There's a whole list of stuff we do. We do a 12 volt to 110 system check to make sure your converter's putting out the right amperage. It's a whole sheet they fill out. Then the roof inspection is something separate. It's on the same sheet because oh, okay. since it's free, it, it, when you come to Guarantee RV, a lot of people don't see it. And even if you come in for warranty yeah. and you say, hey, my furnace isn't working, there's an invisible line down there that says roof inspection because it is, big, it is, it is a big thing for us. Yeah. And it's not invisible. It will actually be on your repair order. Yeah. If you come in for two items and don't even ask for it, it should say roof inspection. Because if it's coming in the shop, it's the best time for us to climb up there and, and tell you, hey, we found an hour's worth of repairs. Do you want to do it at home or do you want us to do it while we're here? Right. I'm looking maybe next month for lead time on this shop. Next month it goes up to $500. Oh. Lead, next month, right now, up, you going to go up north or down here? Here? No, up north. Up north? Yeah, we're uh, not too far out because we got the show coming. We're not taking. We start. Time. We start. Starts yeah, getting busy real fast. Right. Believe it or not, this year we did not see an actual slowdown. Yeah. Last year, February, first part of March was a little slow. This year, we've been a week to a week and a half out. Right now, we're about a week and a half north. By the end of March, we can be two to two and a half weeks out. Yeah. Even with this uh, deer virus, uh, yeah. we haven't slowed down. No, but we have guarantees. Thank you, guarantee. They have taken our detail crews, usually details motorhomes, trailers, fifth wheels, and turned them into rolling. They're going through every department, doing door handles. These seats were all wiped down before we put them here. They have turned into, to, yeah. Motorhomes and RVs can wait. We're going to keep our customers and employees safe. So, okay. Well, believe it or not, we considered it because we have canceled a lot of stuff for guarantee and, and in anticipation of keeping our customers and employees safe. That's our main. Yeah, that's our main thing. So, it was a pleasure to see both of you. Thank you. You're a good liar. So, what's that?